Kristen Smart, 19, was a freshman at California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo when she disappeared in 1996. She was declared legally dead in 2002. In the spring of 1996, Kristen Smart, a 19-year-old college student, left an off-campus party in San Luis Obispo, California, and walked home to her dormitory. She was never seen again. No remains have been found. But on April 13, 2021, after an investigation that spanned nearly a quarter of a century, the authorities announced that two California men, Paul Flores, now 45, and his father, Ruben Flores, 81, had been arrested in connection with her disappearance. In a statement, the Smart family described the long wait for this bittersweet day. Paul Flores was charged with murder, and Ruben Flores with being an accessory after the fact, accused of helping to bury her remains. They went on trial in July 2022 in Monterey County, California. On October 18, 2022, Paul Flores was found guilty of murdering Ms. Smart. Ruben Flores was acquitted by a separate jury. Ms. Smart, who was from Stockton, California, was a freshman at California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo. On May 25, 1996, friends dropped her off at an off-campus party. She left around 2 a.m. and was accompanied by Paul Flores, who was also a student at Cal Poly. He later told investigators that he walked her as far as his dorm, where they parted ways. A missing person report was filed with the campus police on May 28. The next month, the San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Office took over from the Cal Poly Police as the lead investigators. The search for Ms. Smart, who was nicknamed Roxy, took many forms. Soon after her disappearance, a sheriff's search party combed remote parts of the Cal Poly campus on horseback. Helicopters were used to canvas the area. The police searched her dorm room and near hall, finding her wallet and reminders to turn in assignments. Cadaver dogs were sent into Paul Flores's dorm room. Paul Flores was identified as a person of interest early in the case. He has denied any involvement. Missing person posters and billboards offering rewards appeared along roads and in other public places. Ms. Smart's acquaintances were interviewed. They described dropping her off at the party at an unofficial fraternity house and said that when it was over, she needed support to walk as she was being accompanied home by Paul Flores. The Smart family filed a $40 million wrongful death lawsuit against Paul Flores in 1997, but he was not immediately charged criminally in the case. He refused to answer questions during a deposition in November 1997, citing the Fifth Amendment. Ms. Smart's family declared her legally dead in 2002, but the search and the investigation continued. Cadaver dogs trained to detect human decomposition were deployed by the FBI to search on and near the Cal Poly campus. The sheriff's office investigators and forensic specialists assigned to Ms. Smart's case executed 18 search warrants, submitted 37 items that were collected in the early days of the case for DNA testing, recovered 140 new items of evidence and conducted 91 interviews from 2011 to 2020, the office said. The authorities began to describe Paul Flores as a prime suspect in the case. In February 2020, the authorities executed search warrants at four locations in California and Washington state and recovered what the San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Office described as items of interest. One location was the Los Angeles home of Paul Flores, Call TV reported. In March 2021, investigators used cadaver dogs and ground-penetrating radar to search Ruben Flores's property in Arroyo Grande, California. Paul Flores was taken into custody at his home in the San Pedro section of Los Angeles on April 13, 2021, and was charged with murder. Ruben Flores was arrested at his home on the same day and was charged with being an accessory after the fact. The day after the arrests, Dan Dow, the San Luis Obispo County District Attorney, said that Paul Flores had caused the death of Ms. Smart while in the commission of, or attempted, rape. Ruben Flores helped to hide her remains, he said. On April 19, father and son each pleaded not guilty, according to the Associated Press. The two men made their first courtroom appearance on July 14 in San Luis Obispo Superior Court where Judge Craig B. Van Ruyen denied the district attorney's motion to add two rape charges against Paul Flores, the Tribune of San Luis Obispo reported. On August 2, 2021, local media reported that Denise Smart, Ms. Smart's mother, spoke at a preliminary hearing, where the judge was deciding whether prosecutors had established probable cause to proceed to trial. Other witnesses included students who were at the party.
Ms. Smart's family said they had faith in the justice system, comforted in the knowledge that Kristen has been held in the hearts of so many and that she has not been forgotten. Judge Van Ruyen announced in April that the trial would be moved to Monterey County, about 140 miles north of San Luis Obispo, after the defense team requested the change of venue because of extensive publicity around the case. The trial got underway with opening statements on July 18 in Monterey County Superior Court in Salinas. On July 21, Kristen Smart's parents and her brother, Matt, testified about how they had searched for her after her disappearance. For the next 25 years, I did whatever I could and looked for answers wherever I could, Denise Smart told the court, according to CBS 13. On October 18, 2022, Paul Flores was found guilty of murdering Ms. Smart. His father was found not guilty of helping to hide her body. On March 10, 2023, Paul Flores was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison, the maximum allowed. The Superior Court judge, Jennifer O'Keefe, was blunt in her remarks, telling him that he had been a cancer to society who deserved to spend the rest of his life behind bars. For 25 years, you have lived free in the community while Kristen's family has lived a nightmare, she said. The identity of a serial killer's victim has been discovered, more than 40 years after her remains were found on his Florida property. The Hernando County Sheriff's Office descended onto the Spring Hill, Florida property of Billy Mansfield Jr. in the spring of 1981, where they found four sets of human remains, only two of which they were previously able to identity. In 2022, however, officials announced they finally identified one of the Jane Does' 16-year-old Teresa Caroline Fillingham. Fillingham was reported missing by her sister on May 16, 1980, just one week shy of her 17th birthday, according to NBC Tampa. Cold case detective George Loygren said he believed Fillingham was abducted and murdered that same day. 42 years is a long time, Fillingham's sister, Margaret Johns, told reporters. Life is short. It can be even shorter for some, and watch your back, because there's a lot of bad people out there that'll do a lot of bad things to people. Billy Mansfield Jr. was the eldest son of convicted child molester William Mansfield Sr., according to WFLA-TV. The younger Mansfield was in and out of prison starting in mid-1970s, including a stint in Michigan in 1977 for sexual misconduct. He was released after only a few months after testifying against his cellmate. While out on parole in that case, he assaulted two teenagers and found himself back in jail. His other convictions included battery, kidnapping and sexual assault, according to the Tampa Bay Times. After his release, Mansfield Jr. took up work at a mushroom farm in Santa Cruz, California where he lived with his brother, Gary. There, Mansfield Jr. met married mother of three Renee Sailing, 29, at a tavern on December 6, 1980. The following day, passing motorists found Sailing's partially clothed body in a drainage ditch in Watsonville, California according to a 1980 article by the Santa Cruz Sentinel. A post-mortem examination revealed she was sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Officials looked into the Mansfield brothers and arrested them in Nevada. But as California authorities conducted their investigation into Sailing's murder, the high-profile coverage prompted an anonymous tipster to call authorities, imploring them to look for 21-year-old missing woman Sandra Graham at the Mansfield's family home in Florida. Graham had been an employee at a community college and was last seen leaving a bar on April 27, 1980. Between March and April 1981, officials unearthed four sets of skeletal remains from the Mansfield six-acre junkyard in Hernando County. The first of the discovered bodies remains a Jane Doe to this day. The two previously identified victims were Sandra Graham and 15-year-old Elaine Ziegler, an Ohio teen who disappeared from her family's campsite near Brooksville, Florida, on December 31, 1975. According to court records obtained by the Tampa Bay Times, Mansfield Jr., Gary Mansfield, and William Mansfield Sr. sexually assaulted each victim, but Mansfield Jr. murdered and dismembered them. Mansfield Jr. buried the women and teens in his yard, admitting that he wanted them close by. He never told police who the Jane does were. Hernando County officials eventually sought help using DNA to identify the bodies from the University of North Texas and Parabon Nanolabs. The University of Northern Texas created a complete DNA profile of each victim from their extracted DNA in 2020, but entries into databases yielded no results. The profiles were then sent to Parabon Snapshot to glean more information about what they might have looked like. 
Individual predictions were made for the victim's ancestry, eye color, hair color, skin color, freckling, and face shape, the sheriff's office stated. Parabon's research developed a profile that was utilized in the identification of the victim in this case. The recent identification gave Teresa Fillingham's loved ones a sense of closure, according to WFLA. It gives me peace because I know I didn't lose her. That she was taken, said Sister Margot Johns. Now I can stop looking. Billy Mansfield Jr. was convicted of Salings murder in California and sentenced to 25 years to life, according to WFLA. He later pleaded guilty to murdering the four victims found in Florida and received four additional life sentences. Mansfield Sr. was convicted in 1980 for dozens of sex-related charges, including the repeated assault of a nine-month-old girl, according to the Tampa Bay Times. He was released in 1990 but convicted on new charges in 2006. He remains on Florida's sex offender registry. Gary Mansfield was charged with accessory after the fact for Sailing's murder, but he turned state's witness and was relieved of the charge, according to ABC Orlando. In 2020, Gary's home, which is near the property where his brother killed his victims, was the subject of a drug bust, prompting Gary to lead authorities to something suspicious on the property. The suspicious find would transpire to be more human remains, according to WFLA. According to CBS Jacksonville, William Mansfield Sr. lived at his other son's property during the 2020 search. Records show Mansfield Jr., now 66, is still serving his life sentences at the California Healthcare Facility in Stockton. Police officials in Ohio say they've solved a 42-year-old cold case of a young mother who was brutally stabbed to death inside her home. Nadine Madger was just 25 years old when somebody stabbed her to more than 40 times in her Willoughby, Ohio, apartment on the afternoon of January 11, 1980, according to a police statement, she was found dead by her husband, Mark Madger, after he returned home from work at around 5 p.m. The couple's infant son, Dan, was still in his living room playpen at the time, just a few feet from where someone used a carving knife to kill his mother in the dining room. The boy was not physically harmed. In 2022, police announced that a re-examination of the case led them to a former U.S. Marine named Stephen Yaspe Simkak, of nearby East Lake, Ohio, a suburb northeast of Cleveland. I thought Nadine's killer would never be found, an emotional Mark said at a press conference. But they never gave up. Mark added that Nadine did not know Stephen and had nothing to do with him, leaving loved ones and investigators puzzled about a possible motive in the murder. According to police, Simcac died on June 18, 2018. I am angry that Stephen passed away as a free and carefree citizen before he could be identified, as well as caught, said Nadine's son, Dan Madger. And, in turn, given the ability for questions to be asked and justice to be served. During the initial investigation, Willoughby police determined Nadine was murdered sometime between 1.15 p.m. and 4.45 p.m., according to the police statement, which was around the time a neighbor reported a yellow Dodge Dart taxi parked in the rear of their apartment complex. Willoughby police chief James Schultz said there were neither signs of forced entry nor evidence of a sexual assault. Nothing seemed to be missing from the home except for the murder weapon, which came from Madger's kitchen. Nothing other than another knife from the same set was missing, said Schultz. The killer, however, did leave something behind, his blood on Nadine's shirt, which became eventually became the focus of the renewed investigation. A significant amount of blood belonging to an unknown male was located on Nadine's shirt, said police. Some of the suspect's blood on Nadine's shirt was in the form of perpendicular drops, which indicated that the suspect was standing over top of Nadine while he was bleeding. To investigators, the blood indicated her killer was injured in the attack. Police stated they received new information based on the DNA found on Nadine's clothing about seven years ago after establishing a partnership with the Lake County Crime Lab, the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation and the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit. They later teamed up with the Lake County Prosecutor's Office and Parabon Nanolabs to build a family tree from the DNA profile, ultimately leading them to Simcac through the use of genetic genealogy. Investigators compared the male DNA from blood on Nadine's shirt to one of Simcac's biological children and found a match, according to the police statement. People who knew Simcac then confirmed he had owned a canary yellow Dodge Dart back in 1980. Authorities then looked into Simcac's work records from his 37-year career at Lincoln Electric Company in Euclid, Ohio, which is less than 10 miles from Willoughby.
In 1980, Simcak only missed one day of work, the day of Nadine's murder. Simcak was due in for a second shift that day and called in sick, police said in their statement. Police also learned that, at the time of Madger's murder, Simcak had other jobs, delivering flowers for Wycliffe Floral and working with Vitantonio's winery in Wycliffe, just a few miles southwest of both his and the Madger home. But, Willoughby Police Detective Gabe Slay added, he had no criminal record. Simcak retired in 2002 and moved to Bemis Point, New York, about 60 miles southwest of Buffalo, according to police. He passed away at 79, leaving behind a wife, three biological children, and two stepchildren. Madger's family expressed that they held no ill will towards Simcak's family. Simcak was a thief, a coward, a liar, and a murderer, Mark Madger said at the press conference. He stole Nadine from her family and friends. Most of all, he stole Nadine from me and my son. How could he get up every day and look himself in the mirror, knowing what he did? She did not deserve this, he continued. If there's a place in hell, I know he's in it, and I hope he rots there. Chief Schultz vowed to continue working until they could find a motive in the case. A 41-year-old woman shot and killed her then-girlfriend in their apartment, then dumped her body in the woods nearly a decade ago, authorities claimed in an indictment. Wanda Vaguila was indicted on charges of second-degree murder and felony tampering with evidence in the death of 26-year-old Pamela Gratic. Vaguila's alleged accomplice, 30-year-old John Torres, was also charged with second-degree criminal facilitation, first-degree prosecution hindering, and tampering with physical evidence, all of which are felonies. The duo were both initially taken into custody in January 2022 following a collaborative investigation between detectives with the Yonkers Police Department and the District Attorney's Office Cold Case Bureau. Baguila and Torres were arraigned in Yonkers Criminal Court and remanded to Westchester County Jail pending their next court appearance, authorities say. According to a press release from Yonkers Police Department, officers on September 4, 2012 at approximately 5.35 p.m. responded to a 911 call about a suspicious package being found in the woods. Upon arriving at the scene, first responders said they found a decomposing human body that was wrapped in a large black garbage bag. Detectives with the department's major case squad and crime scene unit took over the investigation and were able to identify the victim as Bronx resident Pamela Gratic. Per the release, investigators determined that Gratic had been shot twice in the head at a location outside of Yonkers and dumped in the woods in an attempt to conceal the crime. Police identified Vaguila as a person interest early on in the case, but were unable to explain how the petite woman could have moved the larger Gratic's body to the secluded area in the woods. Following a two-year investigation, authorities were unable to come up with enough evidence to charge anyone and the case was transferred to the Yonkers Police Department Cold Case Unit. After years of additional casework, investigators took Vaguila into custody nine years and four months after Gratic's body was discovered. Police said that Vaguila confessed to the murder during an interview with detectives. Vaguila allegedly said that she shot and killed Gratic inside of the Bronx apartment apartment they shared due to ongoing domestic issues between them. Police say that Vaguila got the murder weapon from Torres. Following the alleged murder, she again contacted Torres who allegedly helped her move the body from her apartment to the woods. The passage of time only reinforces our commitment to solving these heinous crimes. The Yonkers police prides itself on focusing on victims and their families and doing whatever we can to deliver justice for them, City of Yonkers Police Commissioner John J. Muller said in a statement following the arrests. I hope that these arrests bring some degree of closure to Pamela's family and friends, and I applaud the extraordinary efforts of our cold case detectives in closing out this case after so many years, well done. Torres, 31, pleaded guilty earlier this year and is scheduled for sentencing April 20. He was promised a sentence of five years probation that will include six months in the Westchester County Jail. A Maine man convicted of murdering a 20-year-old Alaska Native woman in Fairbanks in 1993 was sentenced on Monday to serve 75 years in prison. A Fairbanks jury in February 2022 had found Stephen Harris Downs, 48, guilty in the cold case murder and sexual assault of Sophie Sergi in a college dorm bathroom. The case baffled investigators for decades and became notorious because of the circumstances, a young woman stabbed and shot while she was visiting friends at college in Fairbanks right before finals week in April 1993. 
Among the potential hundreds of witnesses in the dorm complex, no one had enough evidence to give Alaska state troopers a solid suspect. Then in 2018, DNA science provided a breakthrough. A tiny sample on Sergi was matched to Stephen Downs, who was living in Bartlett Hall that semester, one floor up from where Sergi's body was found. The murder and rape took place in a woman's restroom on the UAF campus in the woman's floor of a dormitory, and the women's restroom is an area where women are likely at their most vulnerable, but this is the location Mr. Downs chose to invade and commit his crimes, said Alaska Superior Court Judge Thomas Temple. Temple presided over the trial last January. He listened Monday to pre-sentence reports from prosecutor Jenna Gruenstein and defense attorney James Howaniak. Gruenstein asked the judge to consider factors to influence a longer sentence, the use of multiple weapons in the crime, both a knife and a gun, as well as using a murder to prevent the reporting of a sexual assault. So whether they're aggravators by analogy, or just factors that the court considers and places weight on for implementing the appropriate sentence, so in this case, the court has very wide discretion in the murder in the first-degree sentence, 20 to 99 years to impose, she said. The judge said he would use the 1993 sentencing guidelines. To the charge of sexual assault in the first degree, the court is required by law to impose exactly an eight-year term of incarceration, and the court has no discretion to deviate from that number according to the laws in effect in 1993. Defense attorney Howaniak asked the judge to consider Downs' health and approach sentencing from a more practical approach. I'll be honest, judge. The way we've approached this is really more on a practical plane, he said. Steve is 48 years old now. He's over 400 pounds. He's got very high blood pressure. I think that his life expectancy is not going to be, you know, 103 years old here. Anything in excess of a 20-year sentence, that's going to be bringing him to near the end of his life under the best of circumstances. Downs attended University of Alaska Fairbanks from 1992 to 1996. He lived in Arizona for a while and returned to his home state of Maine. Both the state and the defense noted Downs had no criminal record before, and had no criminal activity since. We asked the court to consider the intervening nearly 30 years, he's been nothing but a model citizen, Hawaniak said. He became a nurse, one who, who cared for hundreds, if not thousands of patients. He's really been a model prisoner at the Fairbanks Correctional Center. He's helped his fellow prisoners there with everything from their GEDs to help helping to counsel them if they're dealing with depression or substance abuse issues. He was on the dean's list multiple semesters for the remainder of his four years at UAF and then went on to be successful, without a criminal history, for the next 30 years. The victim's brother, Alexei Sergi, was on the phone from Western Alaska before Monday's hearing began, but the call was dropped before he could testify about the impacts his sister's death had on his family. Friends of Sophie Sergi were ready to testify, but Judge Temple said it was not appropriate for this hearing. I will note that there's no sentence this court could impose that there be adequate restoration to Ms. Sergi's surviving family or her extended support network. There's nothing the court could do to restore those folks, Temple said. Stephen Downs, himself, did not say anything at the hearing. Howaniak said Downs maintains that he is innocent of the crimes. Temple handed down a sentence to Downs of 67 years for murder and another eight years for sexual assault. Under Alaska law, if Downs has no problems in prison, he can be released after he serves one third of his sentence, or 25 years. Thank you for watching, make sure you subscribe and like the video, and click the bell icon to stay tuned.